Well, thank you for this uh, very warm welcome and for coming so many of you. It's really a pleasure to see that some people even share one chair to come to my lecture. <laughs> Now, the big question that really fascinates me is why we care about other people. So if you look, for instance, at this image of a Syrian boy, if you look at him, if you look at the tears that he's shedding, the, the really tortured look he has in his face, if you're anything like me or most other people, you don't just realize that this boy is in distress, but seeing him makes you feel a bit of his distress yourself. You get uncomfortable, you get sad, you want maybe even to do something to help him. And for me, the mystery is really why, in a world in which kind of Darwin tells us that we're all competing against each other, why is it that the emotions and the sensations of others penetrate us and affect us so much? And as a neuroscientist, part of how I answer that question is by looking inside of our brain and the brain of animals to really see what kind of mechanisms are at play in our brain to make us feel these sensations that should maybe be just inside of the other person instead. Now, that work for me started by looking at neural activities in monkeys. And the reason I was doing that in monkeys is that in monkeys you can really listen to the activity of individual neurons by using very fine electrodes that you can implant, the monkey doesn't feel pain in the brain, and then afterwards you can directly interact with the monkey while you can listen to the activity of single neurons. And if you do that in this particular brain region that I'm showing here in blue uh, on that brain, which is a part of the brain that we thought was only there for the monkey to perform his own actions, we came across a remarkable observation. So when you listen to the activity of that neuron, and in a couple of seconds you'll have the chance to listen to them uh, yourself, if the slideshow will advance, yes. What you see is that whenever the monkey performs a particular action, like for instance grasping an object, this neuron will start to fire. And you'll hear in a second, you'll see a little movie with the monkey performing the action, and you'll hear that neuron fire. The remarkable fact is that some of these neurons that we thought would only control the monkey's own actions also started to respond when the monkey wasn't doing anything, but the monkey was watching me do something similar. So I could grasp things with my hand or as well with my mouth, and the same neuron kept answering again. So here you would see the movie and just listen to the activity of the neuron. Here the monkey is grasping. Here I'm grasping with my mouth. And here I'm grasping with my hand again. Now what makes the neuron so remarkable is that at that point we thought that part of the brain only controls the monkey's own action. And what we see here is that each time the monkey sees me do something, that visual stimulus, something out there, stops to just be something visual for the monkey and start to penetrate his own actions, as if he'd be doing the thing at the same time. So if you see me now, for instance, taking this glass, hmm and enjoying a nice sip of it. With neurons like that, you would stop to just watch me and you would kind of internally drink with me and enjoying the nice flavor of the cold water. Now, of course, most of you are not interested in monkeys, so one of the questions is, do humans have a similar system? So in humans, we can't put electrodes in the brain to measure the activity of single neurons, but we can put people in a scanner and measure brain activity, not at the level of neurons, but at least at the level of brain regions. And we can do that while you're in the scanner and you do things like grasping a glass or drinking from it. And we can localize all the brain regions that you see here in red that are involved when you yourself perform an action like that. Then we can uh, let you watch someone else perform an action like drinking from a glass. And we find activity in these blue regions here. And if we look at the overlap between the two sets of region here in white, we see something a bit similar to what we saw. 
in the monkey, namely the fact that you activate part of what you would use to drink from this glass whenever you see me doing it. You internally kind of imitate what I do. Now, of course, if you think about uh, empathy, actions are not the first thing you think about, right? You think more about emotions, pain, and, um, uh, and disgust or, or sadness. So we tried to go away from just doing actions and started to do sensations as well. And I remember at one point I was uh, cooking with my wife. We lead the lab together, so we, we get to spend a lot of time together. And we were discussing a, a particular scientific question while she was cutting onions. And we got the discussion so, so intensively that she kind of forgot that she was cutting onions. She just kept cutting, and at one point I could see the blade of the knife enter her finger with a bit of blood coming out. And what I remember was that I could really feel the pain almost in my own finger. I had to shake my own finger because of this intense sensation. So we figured maybe we have neurons a bit like the one we have for actions as well to share the pain of other people. So we figured let's uh, make an experiment about that, measure human brain activity, but we decided not to uh, cut the fingers of our subjects because we figured then we can only get 10 trials and we need more than that to get good results. So what we did instead was to expose the leg of our subject and then with this very high-tech device that you see on the screen, a washing glove, we simply rub one leg for 10 seconds, then the other leg, and if you do that, you can get an image of what the brain activity looks like if you feel touched on your own body. And you see in particular this uh, red dot here, which is part of the secondary somatosensory cortex. And it's partially hidden inside of the brain, so I can kind of open the brain up a bit and you see how the activity comes in. And then we showed our subjects movies of other people getting touched on their leg. So now nothing happened to the subject's own body, but the subject just sees what happens to another. And what we saw was activity in this blue blob here with again this overlap, showing that basically when you see someone else getting touched, it really enters your body as if you were touched on your own brain yourself. And then we figured let's, uh, no, that's still kind of a sensation, let's try to really look at emotions. Now, emotions are not something you can study very easily in the lab because I can put you in a scanner and tell you to be happy for 10 seconds while I measure your brain activity, but it's not going to be very efficient. So we had to find ways to induce emotions in the scanner. And one idea we came up with was to give people an anesthesia mask on their face. I ask you, why do I get an anesthesia mask? But we told them, just wait a little bit, you're going to find out soon enough. Then what we started to do was to either puff pleasant smells into that mask, things like strawberry or mint flavors, and they figured, wow, this is not too bad. But then we switched to you know, the smell of rotten eggs, for instance, butyric acid. And when you do that, you do induce strong emotions in the subject. So we had to take one of them out because he started vomiting in the scanner. <laughs> but for the others, we could now repeatedly induce a very strong sense of disgust while they're in the scanner. And if you do that, you can get a glimpse of what the emotional brain looks like. And you get activity in this region you see here in red, which is called the anterior insula. And what happened while we showed them the movies of other people getting disgusted was that we saw again activity in this emotional region, as if you'd be disgusted yourself. So now if we put all of that together, what we see is that while we witness what happens to this poor Syrian boy, we do not just activate representations of what we see in our visual cortex. We don't just see this image like we would see in abstract painting. What happens is that we activate representations of our own actions as if we'd be doing the same screaming and crying ourselves. We'll activate representations of our own sensations as if we could feel maybe this knot in our own throat. And we can activate representations of our own emotions 
as if we'd been crying and in despair ourselves at that moment. And the idea is that if you have all of that activity together in your brain while you see this boy, you stop to just see the boy and for that moment you become the boy. You are in despair yourself. And because of that, of course, you're driven to do something for that boy as well because the sense of despair you now have is something that you don't like to have. So the best way to get rid of it would be, for instance, to go and help that boy. Now, a lot of what I just told you right now, of course, is a long step away from what we just see by seeing activations in the scanner. So what I'll do a bit now in the rest of the talk is first try to show you some experiments in which we try to see whether this kind of activity is really important to get a feeling for what goes on in others. So an understanding of how we perceive what goes on in others. And we look at two examples. One is, for instance, how much effort someone puts in an action, and the other one is really looking at emotions. And then in the second part, I'm going to try to see whether that really changes the way that you feel while you see the boy, and ultimately whether it would influence how much you're willing to do for someone else. And then in the last part of the talk, I'm going to look at some psychiatric disorders and phenomena that mean that this empathy sometimes goes up and sometimes goes down. And then together we can really reflect a bit what this modulation as well means for us in society and the choices we can make. Now let's start though with how we perceive really what goes on in other people. So what I've shown you so far was the fact that uh, you know, kind of if you take a group of people, you see activity in regions involved in their own actions while they witness the actions of others. And uh, we can make these experiments even in single subjects. We don't always need a group. And if we do that in individual subjects, we get results that are very similar to the ones I've shown you in the group. But if you just do that, what you basically see is that a certain brain region turns on whenever you see the actions of another person. That does not yet tell you that you actually need that brain activity to be able to understand what other people do. I mean, to give you an example, each time I slow down my car, I see a red light turning on in the back. So that's what you see kind of here as well. Certain brain regions light up while you do a certain thing. But does the red light in the back of my car help the car slow down? The answer is no, of course. But how could you find out whether the red light really helps my car slow down? Any ideas? Exactly. So that's what we can do in human subjects as well. So we could, of course, go in and really break that part of the brain that wouldn't be very kind. But we can do something else instead, which is to use uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is basically a coil that you can put on the head. And if you put electricity through that coil, for a very brief instant, it creates a bit of a magnetic field that disturbs a little bit the neurons under it. As soon as you turn off the coil, you're back to your normal mental capacity. But for a short period, you can interfere with a single process in your brain. And then what we figured is, if I ask you, for instance, how heavy this bag is, and you see me lift this bag, who of you thinks that this bag weighs five kilos? Who of you think that it weighs about one kilo? Who of you thinks that it weighs about 200 grams? Well, the participation is not great, but <laughs> <laughs> those of you that participated were really pretty uh, accurate because my computer is no longer in there. My own estimate would be around one or two kilos. The question is, how can you do that? If I'd ask you what it was exactly that allows you to judge how heavy the bag is, you wouldn't be able to answer. You just kind of feel from seeing the movement how heavy it is. So our idea was that maybe if your brain replicates the action in the somatosensory and motor cortices, maybe that's how you know how heavy the bag is. 
So what we figured is let's show people a stimulus a bit like that. What we really showed them was uh, a person lifting a certain number of little blue boxes, and they just had to tell us which ones were heavy, which one were light. You would see kind of the stimulus here. That was one example. This is another one. People are reasonably good at that. And then what we did was uh, we put this TMS coil over the somatosensory cortex. So that's the part of the brain they would use if they would lift the bag themselves and try to guess the weight. But now they simply see me lift it. And what we saw was that compared to a control condition, they were less good at telling how heavy the bag was if I interfere with their own somatosensory cortex. So then what we did as well, we figured, is it something general about judging weight or is it something specific about empathizing with other people? So we gave them another task in which you simply see a ball bounce off a desk and you have to judge how heavy the ball is. There is no one to empathize with. If you interfere with the somatosensory cortex in that condition, there was no change in performance. So it really has something to do with feeling how much effort other people are putting in. Then we can move the coil a bit to know whether it was just the fact that it disturbs you when you feel that pulse, there was no deficit. And we can move it forwards to, uh, for instance, regions that are also involved in lifting something yourself. And there we found an impairment as well. So what that experiment kind of tells us in a very kind of cold scientific way is that if I interfere with the parts of the brain you would use to feel and do your own actions, you actually become less good at understanding what goes on in other people. And this is not only true for actions. So you can do something similar for emotions. The problem for emotions is that the part of the brain that does it is much deeper. And therefore, with magnetic stimulations, you can't really interfere with that brain region. But every now and then, nature makes the kind of experiment that one of you was suggesting, which is to literally break the, the region. And there are some, men, uh, some poor people, for instance, like this one, that got a herpes simplex infection that basically damaged forever one of his insulae. So that's the part of the brain that we had seen before to be active when you smell these terrible smells and when you see disgust in others. And what was remarkable in this subject that has this dark region here because the insula is damaged was that if you'd give this person something really unpleasant to drink, he would drink it hmm, says this is perfectly fine. Indeed, at one point he went uh, on a long summer vacation, turned off his fridge, came back after months, he was really in, uh, thirsty, and before his wife could stop him, he opened the fridge, took out some milk, that by that time had some green clumps on top, and drank half the carton without feeling any deep sense of disgust. But the most surprising fact was that if you show that person a happy person, he can tell you, oh yeah, that person is happy. You can show him a sad person, he can tell you that person is sad. But show him a disgusted person, the emotion he no longer feels in himself, and he's unable to tell you what is going on in that person. And it is remarkable because it tells you that you don't have a particular brain region for empathy because he's still empathic towards happiness, sadness, and a lot of other things. But you basically use whatever specialized part of the brain you need to feel that state yourself to be able to empathize with that state in others. So it's really a very modular mosaic of your own emotions that you can use to read those of others. Now this is just about perceiving what goes on in others. But the question is, does perceiving that really change the way you feel yourself? Now, to understand the degree to which we get really contagious by the distress of others, again, it's difficult to make these experiments in humans because they happen in deep brain regions that we can't control very well. So one of the efforts we really have in the lab is to try to understand whether an empathy is something that we share with simpler animals, like rats, for instance. Because in rats, we can use methods 
to very, uh, that are very sophisticated to uh, regulate brain activity in deeper brain regions as well. So one of the efforts we've done is to really look at empathy in rats. Now, when we start to think about empathy in animals, we have to be a bit more sophisticated about what we mean with empathy. And actually, as psychologists, we, we subdivide separate phenomena that together kind of for lay people build up what we call empathy. And at kind of the, the basic, the roots of this tree, we have a very simple phenomenon that is called emotional contagion. You may have noticed that, for instance, if you have young babies and one of them start crying, the other ones will start crying as well. Now, it's unlikely that babies, newborns, really understand why they're crying because of the other person, that this is really because they witness someone else have that emotion. They just feel distressed by that and start crying themselves. That is what we call emotional contagion. And there is, in this bottom as well, something that is called mimicry, which is the fact that often if you adopt a particular pose, for instance, if you have someone in front of you, they'll tend to kind of converge in a similar pose as well, without giving it much thought. That's what is called mimicry. Then at a slightly more sophisticated level, you have what we call empathy proper. The difference is that now, for instance, you share the distress of someone else, but you kind of know that it's the other person's distress. So you have this kind of mental awareness on top of that. And then you go on to something that is called sympathy. So now if I see you in pain, I no longer feel pain myself, but I start to get warm feelings that I care about you and that I want to help you. And ultimately, you get something which is called pro-social behavior, which means that now you really go out there and you help the other person. You do something for the other person. Now, when we think about animals, two of these states are really difficult to study because it's hard to really ask the animal, do you know that this is someone else's state? Or do you now have warm feelings? Or are you just distressed? But what we can do very well is look at the more basic mechanism of emotional contagion, and we can look at whether they're willing to do things for others. And the kind of paradigm that we use there is really quite simple. We've put, for instance, two rats face to face. They're just divided by a little wire mesh. And then what we do is we look at what a witness does during a social interaction. And these witnesses, for reason that you'll understand in a second, half of them we take and we put them in a room in which we put a little bit of electricity on the grid. It's not really painful, but it's really surprising for these animals. And they get worried about that. The other half, we don't expose to that, so they have no idea what electricity feels like. Then what we do is we put them together with this other animal, and then we do the same with the demonstrator. We give him, while the other one is watching, a little bit of current on the mesh. Again, it's not painful, really, but you see that this animal is startled and is wondering what he's doing. And when rats get startled, what they do is they stop moving completely. They do what is called freezing, which is a way for a rat or a mouse at least in Amsterdam, everyone has mice in their house. I'm sure you've seen some uh, clothes as well. If you kind of open, uh, for instance, the cupboard they're in, chances are that they're going to stop to move entirely so that you can't even find them. That's what you call freezing. And what we see is that while we do nothing to the witness, but the demonstrator, the other animal, gets scared, is that those witnesses that don't know what electricity feels like still show no freezing, but the ones that know what it feels like show high levels of freezing, basically as if they'd be getting the electricity themselves at this moment. So much like humans, rats as well, are very sensitive to what happens to others, and the fear of one rat basically gets contagious onto the other rat. And something we observed that surprised us a bit was that this uh, effect went back to the animals as well that actually get the shock. What I mean with that is that we had two groups of witnesses. Half of them were sensitive to the fear of the other one, 
because they, they had the experience with the shock. The other half didn't care. And what we observed was that the animal that demonstrated that actually get the electricity, if they paired with an animal that doesn't seem to care, they get to calm down and they don't show as much freezing themselves. Whereas the ones that are paired with a witness that reacts with fear to the whole episode will get even more scared themselves. So that's something that my wife always does when I have a headache. She just completely ignores my pain, and that makes me feel so much better. <laughs> so now that we have this uh, in a kind of model, one of the questions we had is how is it that a single exposure to a bit of electricity change completely the way that this witness can empathize with the demonstrator? And that is a more general question that we have in general, is how do you even get to really have mirror neurons, for instance, for me grasping? Are you born with them? Or like this rat, do you need to develop them through self-experience? And we think what actually happens is that even for actions, you have to develop empathy through your own experiences. And how that works, I'm going to show you in a kind of little cartoon experiment. So imagine you have two sets of neurons in your premotor cortex, and you're a young baby. So you're just finding out about your own body. Whenever you activate the red ones, for instance, you, uh, you start to grasp things in the environment. Whenever you activate the yellow ones, you throw things away. Now, when baby activates these red ones and start to grasp things, what does actually happen in the brain? Well, what happens is you see that here in the case of my firstborn baby, and uh, the baby is grasping here for the second time in its life, and it's grasping a piece of jewelry, so I'll let you guess the gender of my firstborn baby. <laughs> but what you can also see is how she's completely fascinated by her own hands and actions. She's really staring at herself doing this action. And what that means is that while she has in her brain activity in the neurons that make her grasp, she sees herself grasp. That enters her brain, activates some neurons in the visual system, and I think that at birth, there are basically random connections between your visual system and the motor system. There's no fine-tuned wiring. But if you look at what happens now uh, in the case of the synapses here, what you see is that some of the red input gets on the activated red neurons, the one that it's just using to do that, and some of the activity gets onto these yellow neurons that are not active at that moment. And there is a rule in neuroscience called the Habian learning rule, which says that neurons that fire together, wire together. It's a very basic and simple rule. But in that case, it has a strong impact because the connection between seeing grasping and doing grasping will get stronger through this rule, whereas the one that maps it onto an other action that it's not doing while it's seeing the grasping get depressed. So that after seeing itself grasp for 10 or 20 or 1,000 times, it will have very strong connections between seeing itself grasp and grasping. And now when it sees someone else grasp, it gets the same visual input, which now by the virtue of its own experience can activate the inner state that is normally associated with doing that action itself. And the same is true for emotions. So while this uh, rat was getting an electroshock itself, what happened is it could hear himself vocalize in fear and start to freeze. And it could associate this internal state with what it sounds like and therefore now empathize with the state of others. Now, this sounds like a hypothetical model. So can you, for instance, in an adult human, create new mirror neurons? Well, in adults, it's not easy to find actions that you have never done. I mean, grasping and all of that, you've done a gazillion times. But some actions, some of you may have never done. So whom of you has never played the piano? Wow, this is an artistic uh, audience. <laughs> But there are four people I could recruit for this experiment. I could put you now in the scanner, 
and play a very simple melody to you. The reason that this melody is so simple is because you can learn to play it yourself in very little time. But if I scan you before you've learned to play it yourself, what I get is only activity in these uh, parts of the brain here in the temporal lobe that are where your auditory cortex is. There's no activity here in the motor parts of your brain. So now I can take you and I can give you five hours of piano lessons. And what will happen over those five hours is you'll have the piano keys in front of you and each time you perform a certain action, you'll hear the note that comes along with the pressing that key. So during those five hours, you always have this matching between the action of playing the piano and what it sounds like. And then after five hours, I can scan you again while you listen to this piano melody. And now you have this additional activity in the premotor cortex. In just five hours, you stop to listen to piano music just with your ears, and you can start to really listen to it with your fingers as well, empathizing basically with the piano player. In five hours, that only holds true for the particular melody that I've taught you how to play. But if you take a professional pianist, for instance, they will activate their own motor cortex, whatever piano music they listen to. So you can really become empathic for something by practicing this thing yourself. And that's what we saw in the rats as well. But so now we can uh, try to understand whether the particular part of the brain we found active in humans is necessary for emotional contagion even in rats. And we do that by injecting a local anesthetic in that part of the brain. So that's the kind of anesthetic you would put as well on your hand, for instance, if a doctor needs to, uh, to cut in your hand. And by putting that in a part of the brain for about one hour, the rat no longer can use that part of the brain that we see in humans to be active when you empathize with others. And if we then repeat the same test where we give a bit of uh, electricity to the other rat, we see that now instead of being scared 80% of the time, the rat is much less scared, only half of the time, showing that you really need this uh, system in your brain to start to share the emotions of others. Now, let's get back to humans now and ask ourselves a question that in society we're often interested, which is, does empathy actually drive you to help other people? And the way we've approached this in the lab is to give people a situation in which they can give away part of their own money to help alleviate the pain of other people. And then we can again play this trick we, where we interfere with the part of the brain that allows you to share sensations with others to see if you will then uh, give away less money to help other people. So specifically, the way that this works is you'd come in the lab and uh, you'd come into the lab with an other person called Selena. And what we then do is that we put electrodes on the hand of Selena, the, the other participant, and we put her in a room uh, with a camera pointed on her. You take her to another room, and I would, for instance, put on uh, EEG and uh, electrodes on your head so that I can measure your brain activity. And what happens is that you get, in the beginning of each trial, to witness Selena get a little electroshock that the computer decides how strong it's going to be. And on this particular trial, uh, you see not an electroshock, but someone hitting the hand actually with a belt. You can't influence how strong the first pain is. The computer decides it. And in this particular movie, you will see kind of an intermediate intensity of about 6 out of 10. Now what I do is I give you six euros. And you can decide what to do with these euros. You can decide to keep all of them. And then at the end of the experiment, you can really take that money and go home. And you go through a lot of trials. So you can get home sometimes with one or 200 euros if you keep all of the money. Or what you can do is give away part of that money. And for each euro that you give away, 
Selene on the next trial will get one unit pain less. So if she had kind of pain six out of 10 in the first trial, if you keep all the money and give away zero, you're now gonna witness her being hit with the bell just as strong again. And you see it really real time what is happening to her in the room next door. If you give away, for instance, uh, four euros, you know that she's gonna not get pain intensity six anymore, but only pain intensity two. And you then get to witness how now she's much better off because the belt isn't hit so strongly. What we see is that our subjects are really very attuned to how much pain Selena gets on each trial. In trials where they perceive that she gets a lot of pain, they give away a lot of money. On trials where they already witness that she doesn't get all that much pain, they give quite a little bit of uh, much less money. And in general, people give enough money to make the pain about half as strong as it was perceived to be. Now the question is, do they do that because they kind of share the pain of the other person? So what we do to test that is, first of all, we go in and we listen to the activity of the somatosensory cortex in which you would uh, feel your own pain. And we try to see whether there's more activity on trials where they give more. And if we do that, we find that that's exactly the, in, uh, the case. So if on a trial you had a lot of activity in your own pain areas, you will give a lot of money. On trials where you perceive, uh, no, where your brain activity suggests little pain, you give little money. And now the really interesting part comes, we use TMS again to disturb the activity in your in pain region. And if you do that, what you see is that people no longer adapt their giving to really how much pain Selene is feeling. So now they kind of give pretty much random amounts of money on, the, on a given trial in a way that doesn't really help her very well because they don't give enough money when she's really in pain and they give sometimes too much money in cases where she isn't in pain at all. And that is really the first empirical evidence that how much we help others directly depends on how much our brain allows us to share their pain. So what I've shown you so far is that while you witness this Syrian boy, you basically have two mechanisms in your brain. You share kind of his action, his pain, his emotions, and that allows you in a way to understand how much pain he's in. So that gives you information. But I've also shown you through the experiments with the rats and the helping in humans, that the more you do that, the more you're going to be willing to do for the other one and the more distressed you're going to feel yourself. Now, these two mechanisms really are quite different if you think about them in terms of evolution because getting information about what happens in others is always beneficial. If you understand more about other people, you can interact better with them. It even gives you an opportunity to maybe take advantage of them because you understand them. So information is always good. But sharing the distress of others and being motivated to help them is a very different thing. Because if you have a limited amount of money, for instance, and you start to give money to, to every person that needs money, you're going to have nothing left for yourself and for your kids, which is something that we wouldn't expect evolution to really favor. So what evolution typically does when you have kind of a benefit in terms of information, but sometimes a cost in terms of becoming too altruistic, is that it develops mechanisms that regulate this empathy based on situation. And what I'd like to do with you now is look at some um, uh, cases in which we really see that this empathy is being modulated in your brain. And one of the first cases that was studied by a colleague of mine, Tanya Zinger, was a place uh, where she looked at fairness. So what she did in those experiments is that people arrived in threes in the lab. One of them is the, uh, the subject that gets uh, into the MRI scanner, and the other two people get to play a game with the main subject in the beginning of the experiment. And in this game, it's about trust and money. And one of them 
is a really nice person, always is very fair, always gives you money back and everything. And by the end of the experiment, you really like and trust that person. The other person is a selfish bastard and always takes all the money for himself, even when you trust him. By the end of the experiment, they really don't like that person. And now what they do is they're in a, the main person gets in the scanner and gets to see either the good guy or the bad guy get electroshocks. And what Tanya does is measure how much the observer activates its own pain system while it's seeing the good guy or the bad guy get the shocks. And she's done that with male participants and with female participants. Now, when she did that with female participants, this is how much brain activity there was in the pain region for the fair player getting electroshocks uh, in the slightly higher bar and uh, in the unfair player in the slightly lower bar. In both cases, there was some activity in the pain region, but there's a bit of modulation. Then she did the same with male participants, and there you can see how much empathy there was for the unfair player. <laughs> now, I find this interesting in more than one way, because one thing you might notice is that actually towards the fair player, the activity level in female and male participant was equally strong. So for those of you that think that males cannot be empathic, this is actually not true. We can. But what you also see is that the degree to which this is modulated by how fair the other person was to you is dramatically different. And if you think about why, for instance, we send our men to war more than we send our women to war, I think that this finding might be quite helpful because nowadays it's not anymore about the fact that men are in a mightier or stronger because a lot of warfare is done with drones and by pressing buttons. But I think this suggests that psychologically it is maybe a lot easier for a man if you tell him this enemy has been terrible, go and kill him, to manage and cope with the internal feelings that that would induce than it might be for your average female. Now, this is not the only case that has been looked at. People have also looked at in-group, out-group differences. So in the first experiment that looked at that, people looked at racial biases. So what they had is they had uh, black people look at a black person in pain or a white person in pain. And they had white people uh, watch white people or black people in pain. And the bottom line of these experiments was that black people had more empathy for black people and white people had more empathy for white people. So when the first experiment came out, this seemed to be something that is really racially biased. So it was a pretty negative message. But then they made another experiment say, in Zurich with football fans. Now Zurich seems to have two football teams and people have strong opinions about which of the two teams is good and which one is bad. And what uh, Tanya Zinger again did was she took fans of Team A and showed them other people in pain, telling them, oh, and by the way, that person also likes Team A like you, or telling them, well, actually, this guy really likes Team B. And she measured, again, brain activity in the pain network. And what she found was that the difference between the red bar, which is how much pain you activate when you see someone that likes the same football team, versus the red bar, which is how much pain you feel for the guy that just happens to like another football team, you see that all it takes to shift empathy is this kind of labeling someone as belonging to the same group as you are, or labeling him as belonging to a different group. And I think we all observe all the time how politicians use that very carefully, right? They speak about we and them. And by just giving these labels, you basically shift people from the blue to the red bar. Now, I promised you that I was also going to speak about some psychiatric disorders. And I think the most striking of them all is actually 
a criminal psychopathy. So psychopaths, sometimes called sociopaths as well, are people that commit really terrible crimes, so they're sometimes mass murderers or mass rapists. And what sets them apart from a regular criminal, if there is such a thing, is that they feel no real empathy for the victims and they feel no guilt afterwards. So sometimes normal people end up killing someone in the heat of a conflict, but afterwards they honestly feel bad about what they've done. These psychopathic criminals don't really have that. So we figured let's try to take some of these psychopathic murderers, put them in the scanner, and try to see if they have or not the kind of activity we had observed in normals. So we took uh, 25 of them out of high security prisons and we first let them watch movies of interactions between hands. So you had some movies like the first one you're going to see where one hand was twisting the finger of someone. We had movies where one hand was kind of roughly excluding the other one. We had cases where there was just neutral touch and we had cases where there was a tender caress. Now then the fun part of the experiment started because our grad student could get into the scanner room and hit these mass murderers with a ruler on their hand to make them feel some pain themselves or kind of excluding them or neutrally touching them or caressing them. Now from the second part of the experiment we could ask the first question which is do they lack empathy because they lack emotions themselves? But what we observed was that brain activity, while they were feeling pain on their own body, was exactly the same as that of normal people. So there was no real difference in the ability to feel an emotion themselves. But what we did see was big differences if we scanned their brain activity while they were witnessing the pain of others. So healthy volunteers get activity in all of these regions I've talked to you about, some of the sensory cortex, motor cortex, and emotional cortex. When we did the same with the psychopathic criminals, there was almost no activity in their emotional brain. They really don't seem to share the pain so much. So our first conclusion was they really seem to lack this mirror system and this empathy. But then we thought about this again and we figured, well, this doesn't completely make sense. Because if you speak to the victims of these psychopaths, they often tell you, gee, I met him, he was so charming, and then um, out of the blue he suddenly started to rape me. But to be so charming, you need to be able to understand other people and manipulate them. So we figured, let's try to scan them again, but this time we asked them to try and empathize with the people in the movies. And what we found out was that if we instructed them to try and empathize, all the differences disappeared. They were just as empathic as normal volunteers. That gave us a much more interesting message that said that psychopathy is not so much the inability to empathize, but the fact that they're not burdened, so to speak, by always being soft-hearted and empathic. If they want to, to understand the victim and manipulate the victim, they can turn it on. But when it then comes to the moment where their goal is to have sex, then they just turn off, for instance, this empathy that would get in the way of enjoying it and just do what they want to do in a very selfish way. And I think that really changed the way that we think about empathy because we entered these experiments thinking that empathy was something you either have a lot of or you don't. So there's kind of a continuum and we think psychopaths were low on this continuum and the kind of very empathic nurses or people were high on it. After the experiment, we realized that we really have to distinguish kind of those two dimensions. One is the ability for empathy, which is how much you can empathize if you want to. And the other one is your propensity to empathize even if you don't want to. And what we now kind of uh, believe is that what distinguishes, say, psychopaths from a highly empathic individual is not so much the ability 
But the fact that those people that really cry in a sad movie and that have to look away when they see violence, it's because they're high on both the ability and the propensity. They're always empathic. Whereas these criminals or these bankers or these selfish people, they often have the ability when they want to, but they turn it off when it gets in the way of making the big money. And if you think about evolution, you can kind of think that there's a place for both of these, right? If you want to have a predatorial lifestyle, it's good to be able to turn it on and off. And you do very well in crisis situations, at war, or in these kind of situations. If, on the other hand, you're really at peace at a moment where collaboration and working together is really important, it's much better to have empathy always on, because then you're going to be much more collaborative so there is room, in a way, for both. And I think people vary in a continuous way in how good they are at turning this on and off. Then, of course, other patients like autism, we don't really know yet where they are exactly in this continuum, whether they may at all have a problem in one of these dimensions. And as well, when we think about empathy therapies, which is something that a lot of people think about, in particular when, uh, when encountering, say, bullyism at school, or when uh, rehabilitating psychopath, a lot of therapies had been about teaching people how to be empathic. But now we actually see that a lot of those people already know. And what we would need to teach them is to make empathy a habit, which is a lot more difficult to do. But that's something that we need to try to understand how to do. So what I would like you to, to reflect about from these last experiments is really to start to think about uh, empathy as a choice. What we've seen from the rats and the monkeys and the humans is that in a way, we have it in our genes, we share it with other animals, the ability to really be attuned to the emotions and the actions of others. We have an empathic ability. But what we see through the examples of, for instance, fairness, in-group and out-group in the psychopath, is that we have the ability to modulate this empathy up and down. And given that we really have control over it, we have to start to think of it as being really our responsibility to decide in a given context whether I will use that God-given, if you wish, empathy, or whether I will decide not to. And I think as a society, we also have to really think about whether we want to encourage people about using that, or whether we want to give them the alibi to basically stop using it, in particular towards minorities, by normalizing the fact that it's okay not to. And I think as parents, we really have an opportunity to nurture that in our kids by really making them aware of that choice and encouraging them to use that if we wish to. And as well, as I've shown to you, empathy is something that we need to learn as well. And to learn, for instance, what it looks like to be sad or happy, what parents do with newborns is they stand in front of their baby and when baby smiles, they smile back. So the baby gets this matching between what it looks like when someone smiles and how I feel when I smile. And we know from, for instance, postpartum depression, where, where often mothers do not have any more the energy to really do that, that really impairs a child's ability to empathize later on. So as well as parents, we should really take the time sometimes to get off our mobile phones and really interact face to face with our children to really give them this outside view of what emotions look like. And I think one example of how, at least in most societies, we come together to really nurture empathy is something that is called the golden rule of ethics. This is really a thread that is common to all major religions in the world and philosophies. And it basically is this motto of doing do unto others as you would have them do unto you. We find it in the Bible, it, uh, Buddhism uh, uses it, uh, in, uh, in, uh, the Jewish people really see that as the core of their empathy. And when you think about it, what that does 
is it gives you the encouragement to really think before you do something about how you would feel if someone else would do that onto you, which is exactly making you empathic in a way. And I find it remarkable that so many cultures encourage that. And when we think about globalization, like we mentioned before, and that's another probe to maybe think about in the discussion, there is sometimes this idea that globalization is kind of called calculus. We, we just globalize because we want to maximize uh, money in big corporations. But I think, as an empathy researcher, that globalization is actually in many ways a wonderful thing. By the fact that science is such a global enterprise, I keep traveling to different countries. I spend time face to face with people of different cultures, different ethnies, different uh, ways of life. And by spending time with them, I really break away this uh, me and them and get this feeling of we all together doing science, we all part of one big group, and I become empathic towards them. And I think the counter movement that we now see with protectionism is really emphasizing again this we against them narrative that I'm very scared of. So now let me just close by wrapping all of that up again. I think what I've shown you is that while you witness what goes on in others, in addition to just seeing what goes on in them, our brain makes us automatically share what they feel, what they do, and the kind of emotions they have. And with all of that together, our brain is really doing something wonderful. It's giving us these insights in other people. And I still remember at school, I had a really good poetry teacher. He told me, if you ever want to describe an experience, like what it feels like to go to see the sea for the first time in your life, don't just tell people what the sea looks like. You have to really engage them emotionally. Describe what the cold water feels like in your feet, what the wind feels like in your hair, Describe them what salt and salty water tastes like in your mouth, what, uh, what the emotion of running in that water feels like. If you give them all of that, it starts to be a real experience. And what we see here is that our brain is in many ways the ultimate poet. It transforms the abstract thing that you see happening in others into the only language that you'll ever really be able to understand, which is the language of your own emotions, of your own sensations, and of your own actions. And I think it's really a wonderful skill to have. But of course, we have to be aware of the fact that we can modulate this skill and that we have a responsibility to do so. And now let me just conclude by thanking all the wonderful people that make that kind of research possible. Foremost, here on the top part, my wife, with whom I've done pretty much all of these experiments. And it's an incredible privilege to have someone you work with that can tell you when what you're doing is nonsense. And I have a lot of wonderful postdocs and PhD students that work with us. And people that you see here, Giacomo Rizzolatti and Vittorio Gallese, that they really uh, discovered uh, mirror neurons in, in, in the lab in Parma in which I worked. And it really got me to, to think about empathy as not just being something abstract that we teach, but something that is inside of our brain. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>